This episode of How to Not Suck at Music is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. Hey everybody, welcome to the show where I tell you how to not suck at music. I give you my advice on what you are doing right and what you are doing wrong and what you can do to improve your musicianship. Who made this guy an authority about what is good and what isn't? Well, I played bass live on national television once, so there's that. So if you want musical advice from a bass player who played live with Kelly and Ryan once, you've come to the right place. Let's check out our first submission. It comes from Edvard Vanessword. He sent me this video playing a very difficult Chick Corea tune called Gotta Match, originally played by John Patitucci on bass. And he wanted to know my advice about what he should do before speeding it up. Let's check that out. Okay, so first of all, props to you for learning Gotta Match, because Gotta Match is not an easy song. It's kind of a tongue twister, I think, on bass guitar. I've tried to learn it before in the past. I've never really gotten it up to speed in a way that I like, but it is a fun song. It's a fun exercise. And the reason why it's so difficult is because it was originally written for keyboard. Chick is a keyboard player. He wrote this kind of spindly, spidery lead line. Spiderly is not a word, but he wrote this line to be played on keyboard really fast and then expected John Patitucci, his bass player, to learn how to play it. Whenever you learn something on one instrument that was originally written or improvised on a another instrument, it can be a very useful exercise, but also something that can take quite a lot of work. First of all, your leg position is a little odd. I would probably try sitting a little bit more forward on that ottoman just to keep a more open body posture. Your right hand technique looks pretty good. I do like your floating thumb where your thumb is off to the left of your index finger and you're using your thumb to mute the strings above where your fingers are playing. And that's a great way of keeping a clean, concise technique. But your left hand looks a little bit strange. It looks a little bit collapsed in on itself. You know, I spend a lot of time talking about keeping a straight wrist because everybody does this sort of chicken claw thing and that's really bad for your wrist, but you're kind of doing it almost the opposite way where you're bending your wrist inward. The fact that you have a collapsed wrist is also reflected in the fact that you have a tendency to collapse your first joints. Whenever you're playing bass guitar or regular guitar, it's important to keep all of the joints bent. Whenever you collapse them like this, the energy from your hand does not get transferred into the fingerboard as effectively as if you had all of the joints bent. And so whenever you try and play faster with this, you will inevitably stumble. And the unfortunate side effect of this is that you'll have to put more pressure into the string to hold it down that's not being transferred effectively from the rest of the fingers. One final thing that I think that you should consider is plucking every note that you play. Right now you're using a combination of raking and also pull-offs with the left hand, so not every single note gets its own articulation. Whenever you're playing something this fast, it gives a lot more definition to the sound to individually pluck every note. This articulation might be more difficult, but it does make it sound better. And if you actually notice John Patitucci when he plays in live videos, he is plucking every note in this melody. So thank you for your submission. Let's check out the next one, which is going to be coming from Joseph is Rad. Let's check out Joseph. Okay, cool. So you're obviously going for that like Jay Dilla unquantized wonky drunk feel thing. It's very popular in neo soul music and you've hashtagged it neo soul. So there we go. But one of the big challenges with this sort of time feel when live musicians attempt to do it is to keep the weird wonky eighth notes in exactly the same place every time. The only way to legitimize you playing out of time is you playing out of time the same amount of out of time every single time in order to create that groove. And that's very difficult to do live. It's easy to do in a digital audio workstation, but what ends up happening, and a friend of mine once said this, it's, it sounds like 
When everybody does this, it's like Jay Dilla is dancing awkwardly in his grave. It's very difficult to do this and be tasteful with it. So let me be a little bit more technical, although not everybody thinks along these lines. At the top of your guitar loop, it sounds like you're playing with almost a quintuplet subdivision. But by the end of the loop, you've kind of abandoned that approach. Keeping the same rhythmic approach from beat to beat in a particular groove is very important for something called entrainment, which is essentially just your body's physical ability to feel rhythm. Now, moving away from the loop and talking about your solo a little bit, we can say that your solo does sound pretty good because you have a nice tone and you, know, you have some good looks in there, but it doesn't really rhythmically fit in with the loop in any sort of logical way I can hear. And so the end result is that the musical statement isn't super clear. Adding to that, the thing that I always ask of intermediate level improvisers, especially when they have some degree of technical facility on their instrument, is can you sing what you just played? And I got that question from Esperanza Spaulding. She asked that of a young jazz improviser when they were improvising something really fast and complicated. And that basically made them pause because they realized they couldn't. They didn't really know what they were doing. They were just letting their fingers fly. So that's one thing that I would suggest that you try when you're improvising over these loops. And what it will do is one, it will make you feel more connected to the music, but it also will simplify your ideas in a way that will feel very musical, hopefully. So thank you for your submission. Let's check out the next one, which is a tune called Myriad, sent to me by Pierre Hayek. All right, so the first and most important thing that I always look for is technique, and the technique here is quite solid. And a general rule of thumb for everybody out there, if you see somebody playing with their bass or guitar on their left leg, yes, it looks pretentious. Yes, it looks kind of stupid. No, I don't really do it all that often, but it usually means that they will have a more relaxed te technique because when you're seated, it does make for a more ergonomic experience on the instrument. There's all sorts of things that you have to do to alter the angle of your bass or guitar in order to have an ergonomic approach if you're playing on your right right leg, but when you play it on the left leg, it does make life a little bit easier for you. And you can definitely see here, they're both playing with a very relaxed technique, very relaxed wrist, upright body posture. It generally looks good. I have absolutely nothing to say about it. Now, the first critique that I would have would be of what the bass player is doing. And the reason why I'm going to pick on him is because he was the one that sent me the video. Your tone needs improvement, or you need to think a little bit more about your tone. Because whenever you're trying to play a certain style of music, it's important to consider all all of the elements that go into that style. Not just musical elements like odd time signatures, but also tone and timbre. And in modern metal music and also progressive rock, bass guitar tone is often very bright. This means changing your strings, having that zingy round wound tone, especially slightly overdriven round wound tone with something like a dark glass pedal or a dark glass overdrive is very important and intrinsic to the sound of the genre. Going against that needs to be a very conscious aesthetic choice. Deciding to ignore it is unwise because you are only going to be seen as an inferior imitation of those who you're trying to emulate. Now, compositionally, this piece is interesting, but at the same time, it falls kind of flat in the same way Way that a lot of progressive music does for me in that it's just a riff that's repeated over and over. And once you repeat the riff, you go on to a new section where another riff happens. Compositionally, it ends up just being one long melody that's impossible to sing that's just a string of eighth notes. You're really hammering out the seven, eight groove. You're hitting every subdivision. Da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da, da, ga, da, ga, da, ga, da. <laughs> explore it a little bit more. One of the bands that I think really explores music to its absolute limit is the band Stimpy Lockjaw, which I think is a fantastic band, and I mentioned them before on this channel. They really take a simple idea, quote unquote simple, and then mutate it in the craziest, craziest ways. And I think that's something that everybody needs to try and explore if they're trying to get into progressive music, because what ends up happening is you take a simple idea and then you don't really go anywhere with it. It's just, there's a seven, eight, and that's it. This is really weird and stupid, but maybe check this out. What if you wrote a melody on top of the seven, eight riff?
that's just one idea. You don't have to go that direction. I just did that for fun. But beyond that, you know, I really did dig this song, this fantastic musicianship. But the point of this series is not to just say, hey, you're amazing. Somebody suggested in a comment on my last How To Not Suck At Music that I show an example of somebody that I thought didn't suck. That is not the point of a student-teacher relationship. I'm not gonna just be telling you that everything that you do is amazing and that you don't need to improve at all and oh my God. Even if something is impressive, I can still look to it and say, hey, maybe you could do this differently because maybe that will inspire you in a different way. Or maybe it will help you with your technique or maybe it will help you grow. I admit that this relationship is a little bit warped, I guess, because this is kind of not the same thing as you sitting there and me giving you a lesson. It's kind of this hybrid format with YouTube. But I am reminded of how Branford Marsalis answered the question, what have your students taught you? What I've learned from my students is that students today are completely full of <laughs> Much like the generation before them, the only thing they are really interested in is you telling them how right they are and how good they are. Now, I really haven't gotten that sort of attitude from people who have submitted videos for this series, but at the same time, it bears repeating. If you're submitting a video, I'm gonna tell you how I think you could improve. This is how to not suck at music, so you got yourself into this. Anyway, thank you for your submission. I really do appreciate it. Let's check out the next one. All right, so let's talk about orchestration. You've written for harmonica, electric bass, and baritone ukulele, which is very interesting from a timbral perspective, but it is also very important to consider whenever you're writing for an instrument, the physical limitations of that instrument. For example, baritone ukulele is a four-stringed instrument, which is tuned like a guitar, except missing its E and A strings. So you start on the D string, and then you have a G string, a B string, and then an E string. Sometimes on baritone ukulele, this D string is tuned up the octave, like I have on this, you ukulele, but also sometimes the D string is tuned like you would have on a guitar. The very first chord that you wrote for this baritone ukulele cannot be played because it is a four note chord which will require all four strings, but the very top note in this four note chord cannot be played on the E string because it is a D and a D is below the open string and that makes it physically impossible. Now, none of the chords that you wrote for harmonica are physically playable on a harmonica because it's actually quite a limited instrument, especially if you're using chromatic notes, which would require a chromatic harmonica, which is even more difficult to play chords on. Now, it seems to me that you just wrote this in a music notation program and were just enamored with the sound of a harmonica patch and the sound of a baritone ukulele patch. And that's one of the big pitfalls of writing music in music notation programs because you're not thinking about what actually goes into playing the music that you're writing. Fortunately, here is a very easy fix. Instead of harmonica, you could write for something like accordion or melodica. Both are reed organ instruments which have a very similar sound, but you could physically play these chords on those instruments. And instead of baritone ukulele, you could just write for nylon string guitar and it would sound essentially the same in the same octave with the same sort of timbre, but you could physically play all of these chords. Now the question is, is do you need to know how to play an instrument in order to write for it? And the answer is, well, no, not necessarily, but it certainly will help. And it will definitely help to know at the bare minimum, the ranges of the instruments that you are writing for. Beyond that, you can study the timbral characteristics of the different registers of different instruments. And this is why you might want to buy an orchestration textbook. Orchestration textbooks generally give these tables, which give verbal descriptions of all the different instruments and what sorts of things that you can expect from which register. And that can be very useful. But ultimately, the best way of understanding an instrument is just talking to somebody who plays that instrument and trying to figure out what is physically possible on that instrument and what isn't. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that this episode of How to Not Suck at Music was interesting and hopefully illuminating. I'd like to extend my regards to this episode's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a subscription on-demand video learning service with lectures and courses from top professors from the Ivy League and other great universities. With a subscription, you'll have unlimited access to a huge library of over 8,000 video lectures about anything that interests you, like science, math, history, literature, or probably more relevant to this channel, music. I can definitely recommend the course titled How Music and Mathematics Relate, taught by David Kung, a violinist who has a PhD in mathematics. If you dig my channel, you'll definitely also like this course. I've ended up saying essentially some of the exact same things he does verbatim. Mathematics that your ear is doing when you're listening to virtually anything. Our ears can do math.
really quickly. It's 12 roughly hour long lectures and I'll definitely be stealing some of his stuff for future videos of mine. If you wanna check it out, you can get started now with a free one month trial subscription. You can start your free trial today at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Adam Neely or clicking the link in the description. If you're at all interested in submitting your videos for a future episode of How to Not Suck at Music, email your videos to howtonotsuckatmusic at gmail.com. I'll be looking through all those videos and selecting the ones that I think are best for the series. If you enjoy what I do here on this channel, please give a comment, like, and subscribe. Also, please consider joining my Patreon because it's the patrons over at my Patreon that really make this channel what it is. I have a new video coming out every Monday. And until next time, everybody. Peace.